Hello, everyone. How good was that? Comfortably the best weekend of the Six Nations so far, I think you'll agree. We had upset wins for Italy and England, followed by Wales and France throwing haymakers at each other in Cardiff until Le Bleu pulled clear. A great weekend. We'll now do our best to recap everything in this episode while also hearing from Lewis Rees Samet and about his progress towards his dream of playing in the NFL. I'm Ben Coles and I'm here in the studio with Charlie Morgan. How's it, Colsey? And also by Charles. Wait, Charles, you're not sitting opposite me. Where are you? No, I am in Wales because I was at the Principality yesterday for those haymakers. <laughs> and how were they? It looked fun. It was it was fun. I, I wasn't actually that impressed by France. I'm sure we'll come on to that, but it, it, it was very fun. Um, they pulled clear because they just had too much ballast. But um, yeah, it was a good game of rugby. I thought for a second we might have the third upset of the weekend. Charlie, not to pull back the curtain too much, but we were just chatting before this about how it almost felt like it needed a weekend like this. Well, it, it probably needed one up set and then to have two on the same day hours apart that's great isn't it yeah we got what we got what we deserve for being righteous all tournament and saying that what this tournament needs is this and it needs ireland's procession to a grand slam to be stopped somehow and who's going to do it and but italy italy beating scotland in a in a thriller and then and then another upset to follow we were spoiled weren't we we certainly were let's Mm. talk let's talk favorite moments let's talk highlights charles if if i come to you what what leapt out for you Nolan Legarek's pass. Oh, yeah. Um, Emmanuel Feyerbosso's run down the touchline in, in the last few moments of um, England's victory over Ireland. Well, don't, and hog, just, don't hog all it, of them. No, and then Italy in general. Don't, Superb. He's nicked all the answers. Sorry, Charlie. Yeah, he has. <laughs> that, middle one, that middle one, he's got inside knowledge as well because he was next to me and I let out an involuntary noise, which was... I, I thought it was honestly going to end with um, England being sort of meekly pushed out into touch when they um, on that final play. But amazing, amazing kind of uh, conviction for Faye Oboso to back himself after seeing the space and communicating that in. And we got him in the um, mix zone afterwards. The quotes will be online um, on our website later uh, this afternoon. But um, he, just the way he spoke about it was, yep, saw the space, asked for the ball. It was Bundyaki opposite me, so I sort of backed myself to get around him. I just thought, "Wow, this guy's this guy's cut from a different cloth." Sort of I think time. I think how it went was uh, Kerr passed the ball to Faye Waboso and Charlie shouted "No," and then on a delay, I went "Yes." I said, "You got to go back. In, you got to go back in field." But no, he's, he's actually all right. In, in, in Charlie's defence, he's done so much analysis on England's not good attack that I can see why he his instant reaction was to think that he was watching a repeat of, of some other blown opportunity. So that, that's okay. Um, I'll have to go with Rome. It's my first time at the Stadio Olimpico, and and they won for the first time in what eleven years. So that hopefully they'll be flying me back for uh, for many trips in the future. Have you got one moment, or the, it was the whole last sort of? I did. I did love. Um, I did love them. Just the noise at the final whistle was great. Best hype man, maybe in the Six Nations, because he doesn't stop, does he? The guy on the microphone <laughs> at, the, at the Olympico. We, we're, trying to, we're trying to rev them up. Like he's he's constantly. He's got Michele Lamaro's engine constantly on it. Um, I, if I had to pick a favourite moment, we'll, we'll talk more about the game in a bit. It was maybe when when George Horn's try was disallowed. You then had Garbisi like trying to rev up the crowd and like so basically celebrating as if they'd won the game. And I was like, oh, that's that's weird. I, th- I think essentially everything good or bad Italy do kind of runs through him and how well he's playing. And he he was red hot. He was he was so good. So yeah, what what a pleasure, what a pleasure to be there. Um, as I said earlier, we're going to hear from Lewis Rusamet later on. So he's kind of building towards his his pro day in the NFL on March twentieth, where basically he's going to be impressing scouts hopefully in some drills i think it's in south florida just trying to kind of you know get on their radar ahead of the nfl draft it's quite interesting he was very complimentary about cam winnett for wales as as we have been to and and yeah i think it's fascinating i mean i mean charlie you're quite a big nfl watcher like me the standard is just so high that he, he really seems to have parked this kind of idea that he's a rubber player because he has to because he knows the challenge ahead and he has to have that mindset to deliver really yeah I love that that's what George Givington is his ex Gloucester head coach said wasn't it he said if you want to know anything about his mindset he's he's decided that his last game of rugby has been and gone and he's now an NFL player and I think you know we talk about he's he's a freakish athlete you would say by the standards of rugby union but in the NFL it's a totally different story right 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a bit of time with Lewis Liner as well in the mix zone after the Italy game, so we'll hear about his impressive try scoring debut. But let's get stuck in first to one of England's best results for years, certainly their best performance, probably since that 2019 semi final. Let's have a chat about it. Okay, given both of you were at Twickenham, I'll, I'll defer to you both slightly for, for insight on this. But, but Charles, it sounds like the atmosphere at Twickenham it, it was the best it's been for, for donkey's years, that it was, it was on a new level. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was just, and, that, and that's what comes from beating one of the best teams in the world. You know, the stadium was absolutely jumping. I was there till quite late because um, I met up with a couple of mates and, and even until... Even until the players had left, there were still fans sort of lost in the revelry of a, of, of a wonderful win. Um, and it was as noisy when the when the drop goal went over. That was as noisy as it's been in a while. It, it seems to always happen against Ireland, actually, because in that game in um, 2022, when Charlie Ewers was sent off, I think that that was a sort of... A, a, in terms of atmosphere, that was quite a defining day as well for for Twickenham. I mean, that that's as noisy as I've, as I've heard it in in a long while, and that was certainly the case on um, on Saturday. And long may it continue. Hang on, I want to hear more about how long you were holding on, hanging around at Twickenham for. Just you know, we we there till they turned off the lights. Like how how late were you there? Not quite until they turned off the lights, but until uh, I watched the Irish team bus leave. Okay, okay. It was tops off in the Guinness tent. What Charles? Yeah. Charles was yeah. Oh, fine. yeah, 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 yeah. Charlie, listen, we, I think we have said repeatedly on here and in and in in writing, so it's on record that we were waiting to see something like this from England on Saturday. Can you just sort of, can you just sort of sum up how pleased you were actually to see them play like like they did, but also how big this is for this side in terms of a step forward and getting everybody on board. I thought oh, it's the first bit first. I think it's I think it's huge um, for the team itself, just because um, they'd have been working towards the plan. I think they would have really seen the the phrase Borthwick used. I'm par- paraphrasing slightly. Was just it was important for them to get validation for their hard work, and I think validation for the plans they put in place, how they targeted Ireland clearly with a big focus on kick return. Um, they needed. We we said last week. I feel like we did anyway that they couldn't just go there and spoil. And England's players said that. He said, we're not just there to spoil set piece and and kick loads and and, and impart um, a pressure game plan. I think they knew, they knew they needed a little bit more. And we said, didn't we, they needed to be sort of slicker in, in transition. Um, I think we said it and I wasn't confident, wasn't entirely confident that they could be that slick. You know, they the two tries that they scored before before Ben Earls um, through uh, Ollie Lawrence and then Furbank from directly from kick return. And they generated generated quick rucks with um the first the first carry or quick enough rucks to just um almost catch Ireland over over committing to the tackle area and then just getting their spacing wrong at both on the first on the first time on the short side and then the second time on the open side. And then they punish them really clinically. Now you do not, you you tend to find yourself saying that about other sides. You you Mm. find that saying saying you find yourself saying that about New Zealand a lot that they'll pick off an overlap quite easily and and make and punish a side for becoming too narrow. We said it about Scotland against England. We say it about Ireland all the time. That you're able to say that about England, I think, um, would have made it very satisfying for supporters and actually very satisfying having covered the team and sort of seeing kind of hints of what they're trying to do felix jones said we want an 80 minute performance whether or not it was that that's the sort of holy grail isn't it um but that you just saw a conviction to go with what they would have talked about in the week yeah there's something really satisfying about it isn't it because you can sort of you you feel personally able to buy in a lot more into what they're trying to do when you can actually see proof of it i thought the reactions afterwards were really interesting because you had ben l was was pretty defiant sort of talking about the, the negativity that are coming England's way and saying that, that people have been calling them the worst England ever. We're still trying to find out who, who actually gave that quote. But but listen, I, I think we're we're both we're all of an opinion that if if that's what is, is needed to kind of rev England up and, and to get that kind of performance out of Earl, great. Earl was phenomenal. I think he was helped by how that pack was rebalanced a bit. Um no slight on, on Ethan Roots, but it, what we saw from England with, they had Slade and Lawrence, that second game, a bit more cohesion. They had um, Itoji Martin and Chesham. Those are two things I think that they wanted 
from the start of the start of the Six Nations, and obviously Mitchell being back fit. How's his engine? My goodness, mm. that that game grew ragged from how sort of high there were quite a, a few because of the kicking changes. There were quite a few long passages and the long passages where England were in possession, and he must have covered so much ground. Um, so well done to his elastic uh, ACLs in his in his knees. Done very well there. Um, but no, Ben Earl is a guy who I think, having spoken to him a fair bit in interviews and things, I feel fairly confident saying that he maybe needs to manufacture those chips on his shoulder sometimes to get to get a performance out of himself and to rev himself up before the World Cup quarterfinal. Where he was fantastic, he said, "I don't feel like I've delivered on the highest stage yet." And then he he sort of almost almost needs to put pressure on himself. I know in age group rugby, he he sort of would look at someone like Tom Curry and really want to kind of emulate him and sort of put pressure on himself to emulate him. Um, and whatever he did worked for him. Charles, can I ask you about, we were quite excited for George Martin to be back and, and trying to guess really how they would get, how they would do with Toji Martin Chesson. Would it be a Toji at six? Would it be, would it be Martin at six? In, in the end, it ended up being Chesson. Martin's return was fantastic. Uh, why was he so effective and so important for England, did you think, against Ireland? He just set the tone physically. He was running around belting people. Um, there was one great moment in the first half where he, um, I think it was under a penalty advantage, where he completely cut Ty Byrne in two um, and it sort of stood over him uh, like a heavyweight boxer. He just knocked out his adversary. It, it really set the physical tone and I think um, he really sort of disrupted Ireland, as did Ollie Chesham. You know, the two of them were running around that, that Leicester have started dubbing them the Bash Brothers. And that there was a couple of times where Chesham put in some big shots. You think of that, where he sort of slightly injured himself, knocking Aki into touch from the restart. Um, it, this, was a, this was a new sort of side to England that we hadn't seen too much, mainly because Martin and Chesham had not played together too too often um but they but that sort of physicality and that brutality was a, a great foil to Atoje who we saw some lovely skillful touches from him and all of a sudden it looked quite balanced the English back the, the disruption point is really interesting because we saw Wales two weeks ago kind of be um quite passive in defense and not not flood the breakdown and Ireland therefore struggled because there were there were bodies like more bodies in the defensive line and while they could recycle, they couldn't find the space they wanted. This was the almost the opposite approach where it was, we're just going to brutalise your breakdown and you will not get any clean right ball and therefore can't have your fancy pods out the back because you need to flood in to actually keep possession, which, which was such an effective approach from England. Yeah, it seems, it seems like in the, in the build-up, it, we were sort of told that there were, or it became apparent that there were two ways England could go about it. Um, the Wales approach you're describing there, Colsey, seems fairly similar to what New Zealand did against them in the quarterfinal, whereby they sort of held off a little bit and funneled them towards touchlines and then went hard with the breakdown of touchlines. Guys like, I think Lester Fy Fyinganuku played in that game and he's a bit of a handful. <laughs> Ardi Saver was a handful out, out wide as well. England would have taken, um, I think, a lot of heart from how they went in the last two Six Nations games against against um, Ireland, where they didn't ha necessarily have this overt blitz approach, which is what, Felix Jones is so explicitly brought in, but they've forced a lot of turnovers through proactive line speed, through targeting um, targeting uh, receivers in in as part of Ireland's phase play, um, and it was just really interesting. Obviously, England still conceded two two tries, and they they were in in transition, weren't they? A little bit. Um, Lovely finish from James Lowe for his for his second, actually. With, with two dive. really well yeah. worked tries, and that's that will be sort of that will part that will that's another reason England can be pleased with how they went because although Ireland were disrupted and the 6-2 bench going wrong or mal or just going wrong out of kind of misfortune with Nash and Forley's injuries Ireland still still got very very close to winning that game because they are a champion side um, so for England to sort of weather the storm I think you always talk about in the Eddie Jones era we saw a lot of fast starts didn't we and then maybe that momentum would peter out and then players were sort of left going, right, okay, um, do we stick at plan A or whatever? Um, there was a real strength and conviction throughout the game for England um, that they knew they had to be good at kick return, that they knew they had to disrupt um, Ireland's set piece. I agree with Charles. Martin was massive in the mall. That, they took away that a little bit from Ireland. Um, and they kept at it and they got their reward at the end. The, the fast start point is, is quite interesting because I messaged both of you when I was mopping up everything in Rome and said it sounds like they've, they've come out of the blocks. What happened uh, in Rome? Absolutely firing. Later. <laughs> later. 
and, now, and so it takes you to both saying it sounds like England are absolutely flying out of the blocks here, but but they might be losing a bit of steam. And, and you both like, well, no, really. I thought I, not really. Well, Charles was like, eh, no, I agreed. Really. I agreed because Ireland did some mind games one hundred and one, bit of kidology, kidology at half time when uh, Crowley kicked the penalty to go twelve eight up. Everybody sprinted off the all the Ireland players I sprinted off the field, that, and yeah. I can't remember who I saw. It might. It was a forward. It wasn't Dan Carl. I'm not going to. Not going to. He wasn't on. Oh, no, he was on. Sorry, um, I'm not going to. Not going to pick that's, on Dan Carl. But worse. there was a player. Yeah, there was a player. There was a player who went not quite down to their haunches, but definitely hands on thighs. I thought, well, we're England flying here because psychologically they played well and were yet down four points and against against a, a good side and they would go down further as by seventeen eight. Um, but no, they 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 stuck at it after half time. I'd, I'd highly recommend Charlie's analysis, obviously. Um, po- post match from yesterday, about one particular point in the build up to the George Furbank try, where Ireland was so kind of thrown out of shape by England that you had five people on one side of the field just opposite Ben Earl, and and, and I know Ben Earl played very well, but I mean that I think everyone would agree <laughs> that's I think everyone would agree that's over resourcing one side of your defensive line. Do you remember how Do you remember how much we went to town at England's in, England's defence for Tommy Allen's try in, in mm. Rome? It, it reminded me a lot of that where. It's just speed can really kind of um, really really throw off defensive structure, and that's what that's what England did, and what we haven't seen them do for a while. I know, um, Charles. Let's talk about the ending, and, and particularly um, Manny Faber-Bosa has just made a, a fantastic impact on this team in the last two games. Uh, speaking to people through a piece, kind of in the build-up about his incredible rise. I mean, it really is a year since he was playing for Taunton in, in National One, and, and look at him go. Um, the vibe was very much. I just hope they can sort of give him the ball and, and time and space to to be to be him and, and to show how effective he can be. I would say that they did that at the end. Would you agree, Charles? Yeah, I would. I think he's touching world class. To be honest, like already he looks absolutely superb. He's he looks when he came off the bench at Murrayfield. He looked like he was sort of playing a different sport. He just covers the ground so quickly. He's so strong. He's so lean. He's he's built like a brick outhouse, and he's his, his start was completely justified, and he looked as good as any of the wings on the pit. And in terms of the actual finish itself, a cracking moment for Marcus Smith with the with the drop goal. I saw some interesting points, and we might have actually had these in our in our questions this week. Thank you for sending them in. We'll get to them. Um, People just querying Charlie whether, because England had that penalty advantage so close to the post. I mean, I feel like this is a bit like looking a gift horse in the mouth. Like if you, if the drop goal was there to win a game against Ireland, you take the game against Ireland. I don't know. Should, Maybe should they have risked something to try and get the bonus point try, given that the penalty advantage was being played. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a coward. Maybe I'm technically inept, but I <laughs> think I'd have given myself two chances as by taking the drop goal and then also with that with that penalty in the in the back pocket. It's what true. Do you think? Am I? Am no, I a no, coward? no, no. It's true because it's easy. It's so easy for everyone who isn't Marcus Smith to sit here and say, "Oh, that penalty is a, a gimme from however far out." Like you know. That you, point does change the dynamic a little bit, as far as if England if England do get it, uh, they're um, they're within three of Ireland going into um, going into the the final weekend, and therefore it's any sort of win, um, any sort of win for Scotland mm-hmm. that gives them a bigger chance of it. But I think I think they deserved it. I think I think that was I think that was more the thing. I don't think it's going to make any difference to the table. Um, because I think surely Ireland are going to beat Scotland I- 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 in Dublin, but I think they deserved it. I think they were significantly better than than Ireland on on the day, and I think they deserved that bonus point win. Yeah, I think I think it, it, it was just it was a ment- it was more of a mentality thing if they had gone for it, and that just to get that four try, just to say that we've beaten one of, if not the best team in the world with a bonus point. I think Joe Marler was desperate for the ball, wasn't he? Based based on one one tweet that I saw, where he was basically having a go at his Quinn's colleagues for not supplying him with a, a short range carry right before the drop goal. I mean, to his point, he was part of a bench that a front row. I think the front row were brought on with twenty five minutes at least to go, including including Theo Dan. Um, that was really, but I thought that was a proactive, really impressive part of um, of how Steve Borthwick managed it. And and Joe Marler's kind of alive there. He's calling for the ball for Danny Kerr to just tighten up that ruck defence. So 
serious point is, you know, he's he's a pretty switched on rugby player, Joe Moore. He hasn't got to try in, in however many tests, does he? So I, th- I think that's really the uh, the main gripe. Um, we should t- so we talk about Ireland. You've mentioned the disruption, obviously. I mean, that's the that's the issue with the six two. Sometimes it can backfire, and you will have to play a, a scrum half on the wing. But they just. Charles, they just couldn't get going, could they? Because of the work that England did, we just we didn't. They didn't look slick. They never looked comfortable. And I think Peter Marney kind of said that that they just England just disrupted them to a point where they were kind of limited in their approach. You still you still had you know Bundyaki pouncing for the odd turnover and 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 flashes of control, but they weren't they they weren't quite themselves. And and is that actually that's a huge compliment to England? I'm guessing. Yeah, and I mean, as as Charlie said, it's testament to their class that they were still realistically in with a shot of winning that game until the until the final play, despite the fact that they were almost to a man outplayed by England on the day. Um, but they'll be back. They'll be back. I think they'll beat Scotland. I think they'll beat Scotland next week. Um, they'll be Six Nations champions again. Okay, that the, the, the two successive Grand Slams have have evaded them. The Six two split when you. When that happens, it, it, it looks foolish. I wrote that in the player ratings that it looked foolish, and ultimately you could say it's cost them the game, really, um, because the the forward cavalry that came on didn't do enough to to mitigate for the the issues in in the back line. Jameson Gibson Park, I thought England could have exploited him on the wing more, but even then, he he was. He was coming off his wing and, and playing beautifully on the wing. He put in the scoring pass for low, didn't he? And for that, was it with those second try? Um, some a, a beautiful quick hand. And yeah, I mean, they they obviously managed it well, um, given given the circumstances with Jimson Gibson Park out on the wing. But he shouldn't never have had to have been there in the first place. I don't think. Where do we sit? Just to wrap up this section, how how do we kind of feel about the final? Um, decision by Colin Murray to, to kick to touch with about nine seconds left, I think it was. Would you? It's an interesting debate, isn't it? Do you try and push England back into their own half and make them attack from deep? I mean, obviously, that worked out for England because of Faye Waboso. Or do you go through the phases in your own 22 and just try and wind down the clock? Per- personally, doing the going face to face, ruck to ruck in your own 22 or around there really gives me the, the, the jitters just because there's so many breakdown offences that can happen yeah. and, and your forwards are your forwards are knackered. Like you could easily go off your feet or you could seal off or you could come in the side. And you've been harried by England for the yeah. whole game in your own half. So England, England, just a tiny, to touch on their defensive strategy really, really quickly. One element of it from restarts was to be kick long to Aki, uh, Ireland's best, best, um, best carrier, have Chesham and Faye were both so go after him. And then off the next phase, when they're playing back in, in field, you had Underhill and Atoji really putting pressure on that. And then Ireland, and then England aimed to put a lot of pressure on James Lowe's clearance. That's just a sort of a snapshot of the pressure they were trying to put Ireland under in their own half. Now, I'm just looking at now, it's it's about 90 seconds left when when Murray clears. I think you're doing that all the time. I think you do it from the edge of your own 22. I think I think that's just the decision. That's the decision 90, 90 times out of 100. And you're backing, in, in, and because you're doing that, you're saying, well, we'll back our defence against England attack rather than our ability to keep the ball against the defence that's been harrying us. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I just think that was... They gave England one more chance um, to to attack them with 14 men after Ch- after Chandler Cunningham South was off. It's not a bad decision. It's perhaps the issue that it was a kick to touch. Maybe would that would might they have been better off kind of kicking in field, perhaps kind of centrally, and then coming up as a defensive line. Maybe, to make maybe in play. hindsight, that's something they think about. Yeah, uh, only because it, by England having a line out is sort of a chance for England to rest, kind of get an idea of what they want to do, and, and just get an extra bit in the legs I mean if I'm quibbling maybe that's the the thing but but like I said yeah if they if they'd been going ruck to ruck that would have made me very jittery because so much yeah. could go wrong and England counter-attacks really well so there's there's nothing to say that them keeping the ball in field would have ended any differently I, th- I think Charlie's right I think they had to back their D I mean, getting the ball you know you, you, it was unlikely it, if as a bookmaker you would have been giving it short odds on England scoring a try um, there at the front from that line out, um, but it would have been much more likely to concede a penalty. Running down the clock for ninety seconds always ends in tears, which just makes what England did all the more impressive. Given they managed to manufacture a goal to win, a, a great day for England. 
Ireland will be back. Let's have a chat about the other games in the Six Nations this weekend. Okay, over to Rome and the uh, the earlier upset of the day where Italy, after uh, 10 years and 51 weeks, I made it, exactly, finally won in Rome again in the Six Nations. Uh and they were they were well worth it actually because Scotland Scotland did a Scotland and they can only seem to perform at an exceptionally high level for patches in this tournament and then mentally drop off and and sort of implode into themselves and that paved the way for a, a great win. From your perspective, where were they flattest? Or where did they give give Italy the most kind of ins into the game? It's dumb penalties. It, it's dumb penalties, just like it was. So, so in card, if you remember, they had there was that ludicrous penalty count at the end. What was it like four to fourteen penalties or something? Where, where the amount in a row, yeah, yeah, where Scotland were kind of blown off the park, and 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 Greg Townsend after that game was actually sort of like, look, this is this is weird, like this is an anomaly that doesn't normally happen. And then and then in the France game, uh, they then had a ridiculously low number of penalties. I think it was like six or something. Here in Italy, they. they when that George Horn try was disallowed just after half time, Scotland would have it would have been a conversion under the sticks. So Scotland would have just gone they would have gone thirteen points up and you kind of thought mm, that might be the end of the the start of the end of the contest if Scotland can just keep their nerve. But they're just giving away too many dumb penalties. Like at the at the ruck in terms of sealing off or kind of going in for turnovers when they're not there. I, I think there's a real question about their mentality. I think it's been the theme of the whole championship. Is Scotland are constantly being tested about have you got the nerve to hold this? They did against England because they went ten or down, didn't they, in the opening minutes? A game where they were big favourites. I think everybody thought, oh, here we go again. Scotland are going to blow blow their big chance. And actually, partly because England produced an absurd number of handling errors, Scotland came back and won that game. But but they just they they collapsed here. It was well. That does a disservice to Italy. Scotland collapsed, having started incredibly impressively. They actually looked like they were going to run away with it. I thought what Italy did in terms of their creativity, in terms of resetting at half time. Th- there's a lot of flair in this Italian side, but they're quite pragmatic in the way that their their kicking game works. I was going to say that that what impressed me was a blend of it. Yeah. Um, they they've got a really nice kind of balance about when and just talking about how they're playing in their own half. Whether they go right, no. That this defence looks solid. We're going to go long with a kicking game, or they go. Let's have let's have a look. Let's have a look out wide, and then we can always fall back on that kicking game. It's really really nice blend. Whereas before under Crowley, you'd probably say that they were just all out, all out hitting width all the time, and that gave sides opportunities to squeeze them. Um, I think you can really see what, how the the kind of blend that Gon- Gonzalo Casada has kind of implemented there, and it's exciting. I, I and, what, and what a missed opportunity for Scotland. Given what happened at Twickenham afterwards, you know, they if if they'd have just held on for that win in Rome, they'd have been going to Dublin for a tournament decider. I know. I, know. I, I think I think what I like about Italy is that there's not there's quite a strong mentality here for quite a young group. So that so that you're talking about young guys here, like most of them are in their early twenties and, and not a lot of caps, but they didn't when Scotland were pretty much scoring off most of their attacks in the first half, Italy didn't crumble. They kept they kept in the fight. But Garbisi missed one sitter of a kick, but actually his his control was just brilliant. And just to tee up kind of how Italy came back into the game and took the lead, I've got a bit of audio chatting to Lewis Liner after the game. I mean, we need to chat about him as well, but here's what he had to make of his very, very promising first start for Italy. And it's an amazing atmosphere. The only thing I've come close to is... Stad de France um, when I went with um, England uh, travelling reserve at the end of the Six Nations a few years ago that, that atmosphere is very similar to that and I, I'd love it just to keep being like that no matter win or lose um, full house every time we play it would be <laughs> it's a big ask but it's a, it, it made a huge difference I can tell you that from all the boys being in there What was the last message from your dad th- this morning in terms of advice of how to hand- handle the moment? He said nine's his lucky number so it's, and today's the 9th of March so I kind of good omen again but no he said just go out there and just trust yourself and obviously a few tactical things in there but it's just be yourself and trust the people around you and like I said in other interviews that all the guys when since I've come into the team have been amazing and helped me in any way I can whether it's with moves or what to do and I tried to also maybe offer some advice as well but I think we really clicked today again it wasn't perfect and we got some things to work on going into Wales but definitely a high right now I was going to say how often have you and Paolo had a chance to work on like running onto those grubbers because it worked perfectly there yeah, to no, I, um, I've been trying to 
try and work on that, just seeing where the space is. And yeah, we've got a really good system in, implemented by the coaches, but also rugby's rugby. If the space is there, we're going to take it. And um, I think we're really adapting to that well. And we've got an amazing, talented group of players. And it just shows that when we can put it together, all the hard work, and when we're up for it emotionally, it's, it's all there. Saying that, it doesn't need to be necessarily a perfect storm for Italy to win. I feel like the group going forward, there's something amazing coming in, and I think we can be hopefully going to Wales, heads held high, and go for another win. But I think we're building something really special here. And just for you personally, there's been so much attention on, on leaving Queens and and choosing to play for Italy, switching to play for Italy and not England. How, how would you sort of reflect on the last few weeks? Because obviously there's been a lot of attention. Yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, hasn't it? Um, <clears throat> no, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously sad to leave Quinns. Um, uh, it was an opportunity that was amazing with Benetton. And um, it's sad, obviously, I've been there since I was 14 and it's where all my best mates are. But it's, sometimes you've got to step out of your comfort zone and try something different and hopefully it succeeds. <clears throat> um, and obviously the Italy, the Italy call up, I didn't really, didn't really expect it. So, but no, I'm, I'm trying to gra- try and stay, enjoy it at the moment, but also stay calm and do the best I can. And hopefully that means I can continue being in these moments. So as Lina said there, basically at half time they, they had a chat, realised that Scotland's defensive linemen it can be quite weird and they can leave a lot of space, mainly because they kind of have two, well, so like two sweepers out wide who will then cover in if there's anything in the middle. And so that led to that brilliant kind of Garbisi grubber almost like side on where he slotted it through which gave Lina the space to kind of cut through and, and beat a couple of men to score I, I thought that adjustment was really interesting it, Italy are just fun I, like, I, I know we, ha- we haven't said that that much over the years they're just exciting I think in men and cello and in Brex they've probably got I don't know if you're thinking about form over the championship probably the best centre pairing maybe after Aki and Henshaw in terms of how well they're playing men and cello has been Awesome, He's so good, absolutely awesome, so just good. Thumps, As is Brex, just, yeah. The Bre- Brex is Brex is the ball player with those those pullbacks, and they they play a lot of the, those loop plays, don't they? With Garbizi kind of goes ghosting around. Um, but Manichal just thumps things, both sides That's of the ball, fun. thumps breaks downs, thumps uh, carriers. He's, he's just fantastic. There was one moment where he got cleared by a, a Scotland forward because he he had a dabble with a jackal. And um, the, the Scotland forward sort of sort of stood over him for a second. The manager rolled away, sort of looked and just looked back at, it, at him as though I'm going to keep doing that all day. And he and he and he really did. He's a fantastic player. Just to go back on your point about how it's a young side, Colsey Lamaro is captain, captain at 25 years old, and he's a friend of the pod, of course. He, oh he's yeah, he's been sorry. on here. Yeah. He's been on here previously. But then when in that interview he spoke about how. Um, there had to be a patience around it because they were going to learn on the job because they were all young and, and basically just just watch us. Um, did he leave from the front? Wow, twenty seven tackles I know. Um, and actually a win, a big win for Italy under twenties over Scotland over the weekend as well, which is seriously exciting for their future. His mentality. And what about Ross Vincent at number eight as well? Yes, your mate. Is he friend of the pod? Or is he? Yeah, I think so. Contact, oh, so contact of the pod. pod. <laughs> has been spoken to yeah he he had a phenomenal break in the second half I, I was just thinking about moments from Italy which made me really encouraged the, the scrum in the second half absolutely decimated Scotland like they, they fell apart I loved talking about Menoncello yeah his carrying his carrying was mad but he had a it, it, it came to nothing because Scotland scored through Carl Stein but he had an amazing tackle on van der Merwe in the first half when when basically it looked like van der Merwe was certain to score and Menoncello somehow got around his legs and pulled him down um, and also the Brex try was just a really interesting kind of set play where Italy attacked off a mall and it looked for all money as though Pajarello at, at scrum half was going to flick it back to Garbisi and actually just put in a little grubber over the top for Brex to score, which I honestly don't think Scotland were, were expecting in any way, shape or form. It's quite rare to see a defence completely caught out by something like that, but he just he just found the space behind and, and, and it was... It, it was such a clever attacking play that I was really impressed by what Italy had. I just think they've got so much potential with players in this team. And and let's be honest, we'll, we'll chat about Wales in a sec, but I feel like they're favourites next week going to Cardiff. I mean, I mean, if they can recreate that kind of cohesion we saw yes, on Saturday, why not? I'd agree with that. I'm just trying to think about what else. I think... Lam- Post match interviews are quite interesting because sometimes you, you almost hear what you want to hear. But I thought Jamie George and Lamro had great ones on Saturday where Jamie George said, Look, we were probably rightly written off after the Scotland game. 
but we finally show more we're about kind of thing. And Lamaru was was equally good because he said the Wales win two years ago was kind of like a bolt from the blue. Nobody expected it. This is more. This wins more. What we're about. Like we've taken. We've had a couple of years to work on this. This is kind of our development. And I just thought, yeah, take me along for the ride. I'm I'm on board. Wales are nine point favourites. That's we, that's it's mad, isn't it? But the, but what? we did, but in fairness, we did we we did flag this last week. I think. That last last year's fixture between the sides, it was set up to be, you know, Italy's chance. They beat them at home last year. Now they beat them away. Sorry, last year. Now they've got them at home. And they laid an egg, didn't they? They were, but they were really bad. Oh, yeah. um, Reese Webb just just cut them apart. Um, yeah, this time does feel feel different, and it's going to be on on Wales to rouse themselves. And just finally on on Scotland and on this game, Cricket Townsend was asked point blank after the game whether this result has any impact on his position as head coach and whether it's under threat. Was which, that a punchy which, question? That feels like it's it's it that the whoever's asked it there. There's got to be something building up that we we're, that we're not seeing. Because... It wasn't it wasn't me. <laughs> I, should, I should clarify. <laughs> but I, I I well, I guess it depends how harsh you are about where Scotland are because and if the World th- Cup, I suppose. Well, I almost have more sympathy for the World Cup because of the group they were in. Yeah, I, I think what people are annoyed about. I think people are genuinely frustrated that this is clearly a very talented team who should have beaten France before it came down to that final try, nearly blew it against Wales, and then blew it here in Rome. I think people are, are, are no longer just thinking that Scotland are, are plucky because they're not. They're too good for that. I, ju- I just find that I find that chat quite jarring, I guess, and I'm probably biased because I've covered most closely their games against England where they look like a really balanced side with mm. loads of options, punching above their weight given their small player pool. And you just mentioned there, guys who are coming in, Andy Christie, who's oh, had a fantastic great. season for Saracens. I mm. have to admit, wasn't wasn't entirely sure he'd be able to translate that to, to test matches, but he's that he looks promising and really promising in that regard and, and a really exciting player. And then they've got all those options. And then, but, but again, losing to Italy is not, is, is somewhat, but it's really suboptimal. Just, just one final moment about heads going. Dylan Van der Merwe had a break at the end where I think George Horn was on his, no, Ali Price was on his inside. And, and Van der Merwe cut in and killed off the space for Price. And, and, a, and what seemed like a fairly decent two on one opportunity to score went. And, and that was the moment where I thought, oh, like you're, you're not quite there mentally to win this game at, at that point. So that's where I think the frustration comes from. Tansen's not going anywhere. Let's let's be honest. I don't think, even though, even though this is a disappointing end to the tournament. Charles, you're still in Wales. You're still you're still the other side of the river. Tell us about yesterday. You, you said France didn't play that well, and yet they scored forty five points. So I, I'm intrigued. They were, they seemed very direct. They were very route one. They sort of reverted to type, and they it was a bit of a get out of jail free selection by Gautier. It felt really. It just felt we'll just chuck all these monstrous blokes in and we'll go and bully Wales and overpower them and and they did that is that is literally what happened there wasn't much artistry or creativity to it I think the outside backs were also very direct when they had some space you know they've got a stopgap fly half Thomas Thomas Ramos is nominally a fullback playing playing 10 and it was just had a bit of an armchair ride, really. He didn't seem what to want to create much. He just lined up the um, the big lads in midfield, one pass up, you truck it up, lads, and we'll we'll try and play off you. I think Wales, when they stopped them at source, when they got off the line and when they chopped, were impressive, and that's where that's when France struggled. It was when France got on the front foot, when they got that momentum, that they were they were virtually unstoppable. When Wales got off the line, Daffy Jenkins I thought was excellent, Tommy Raffle I thought was excellent. When they got off the line and when they stopped them at source, France looked a little bit out of sorts. The thing is, the reason you know the reason why the scoreline flatters France in the end is that in the end Wales just couldn't stop them at source for eighty minutes. So France ran away with it in the last in the last fifteen twenty minutes. Um, but until the hour mark, you know Wales were winning at the hour mark. Um, because they were they were coping just about with France's physicality, but then France brought on basically their own bomb squad um, in in George Henri Colomb and um, Roman Taufifanua and Sebastian Taufifanua and Malvaca, who's replacing Mayafu and Antonio, and it was just all too much. What's the French it, for bomb squad? I have absolutely no idea. Squad oh come on, <laughs> come no. on! It just, there won't be a good translation. 
You've been like a uh, a kid at Christmas waiting for me after his debut. Did it live up to the hype? He had a lovely, lovely little pullback pass for that Gail Fiku try, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was good. Um, obviously, he's been injured, so he was substituted early on. Um, and just chatting to him afterwards, he's just a really lovely bloke, given that he came out of nowhere, for, given this lifeline by Toulouse, and now he's like, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm playing Test Rugby for France. Uh, he was good. He was obviously well-marked by Wales, but in the end, that... But, you know that ended up benefiting France because he'd he'd take out three he'd take out three Welsh defenders when he carried. They were getting up and they were they were chopping him and they were aware that he was a big bloke and so he wasn't necessarily making a sort of really tangible uh, impact in terms of yardage. But what he was doing is he was sucking in Wales's entire back row and then there was space elsewhere. France struggled to frankly to exploit that space elsewhere. There were three forward passes, I think. Um, and some of the attack was a little bit clunky. I think the midfield, uh, I think G- Gal Fiku is not playing the best rugby of his life, I don't think. De Porter at 12 looked promising. Barre at 15 looked promising. And, and BLBRA and Penno are obviously just absolutely lethal and, and lightning. Um, and obviously, we have to talk about friend of the pod, Nolan Legarek, who um, replaced Maxime Luku, um, got man of the match, and deservedly so. You know, he was he was really lively at the base and he deserved man of the match just for that pass, really. I was going to say, is the real winner from Sunday actually me for backing Legarek to the high heavens to be good in this Six Nations and actually getting a player of the match award out of him? I feel, feel vindicated, Charlie. I feel vindicated. My my breakthrough player was Joe McCarthy. Who's been, he was started quite, hot. It's quite quiet, to be fair. Started on, hot. Uh, on Saturday. In but the tournament. And, yeah. I, thought, I, thought, I, think my, I think mine was Mayafu, I think. So it's, that's also slightly backfired in that he's been injured for the first three games, but hopefully he has a stormer against England. We're there, we're there overall. Um, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought France looked like maybe England did a little bit at Murrayfield with those backline changes. Those backline changes when you when you sort of surrender that cohesion, that it just does. It's really boring. I think it's really boring for coaches to sort of go up on a pedestal in, in press conference and go, guys have some patience with these changes because they will come good eventually because we need to blood these players, but it might look stodgy for a bit. It's boring to say and it's boring to write about, but it's just it's just a reality. And I, th- I think that's where France were um, with the forward passes with some of the defensive lapses in the first sort of three quarters of that game. But yeah, the, the power and what they have there is 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 pretty formidable and, and just Wales, uh, as as game as they were, just couldn't, couldn't live with it, it seemed. Uh, but- I was surprised at the lack of ambition though. I think I, I was surprised at the lack of ambition that came later on when the game was gone. But certainly in the first half, the, bar the Lagaric, uh, you know, magnificent pass, there did seem to be a real lack of ambition from France. It was just a sort of, we'll send the big boys up and then we'll keep sending the big boys up. And if that doesn't work, we'll send the big boys up. You've touched on Wales being um, shockingly large favourites to win against Italy. I think I wrote before the start of the tournament that two wins in this tournament for Wales would, would be great. And and actually there was a point yesterday where I thought, well, you know, like France have been been a bit off in this tournament, maybe today's the day, and and then it all fell apart drastically. The the, pa- the power issue is is really concerning. The scrum issue is really concerning. That that's flared up at times in pretty much every game this this week. And and to actually to tear up our chat with Lewis Rees Summit in a little bit when I spoke to him, he even he mentioned that Wales during kind of patches in the, in their games in this tournament have been really good. They're, they're just trying to get it together for eighty minutes. It's hard at the moment yeah. for Wales, isn't it? It's hard because yeah. we, we talk we talk about the regional struggles and and the issues there and and the player pathway coming through and and there's so many young players in this side who are kind of learning learning on the job. It, yeah, I, I'm I'm struggling for optimism, Charlie. Bonus points get them off the uh, get them off the bottom if they beat oh well if they beat I mean, Italy by the by the margin the bookies reckon they will um, and I think you look into you look at the individuals for for the crumbs of optimism don't you so Wayne Wright Raffle win it it's still got some they've still got some itch I think Thomas Williams is it needs to become a more and more important player for that side because he's just the spark plug he's he's so so kind of lively um, and get a lot of things going through him. Um, then you, but you're just looking at quite important positions. You know, ten that centre combination is that we, you know, that that so that entire midfield that just needs solidifying over the course if they are going to progress over the course of this World Cup cycle. I've got a question for the two of you. Oh no, go on. 
good mate of mine, who I'm going to have to give a shout out to, John, had an accumulator. Ooh. Oh, on, yeah, you told me about this. On Italy, yeah, England, and Wales to all win. Did Ooh. he cash out? Punchy. £10 would have got him £790. <laughs> and on Saturday night, he was offered cash out at 200 uh, Would you have cashed out? I mean, no, me, I, fa- I fancied Wales by a score. My mates and I have a strict rule about cashing out results in punishments, so I wouldn't have done it for that reason. <laughs> well, I got on my high horse because I told him to cash out. Oh, well, there you go. What did, what did, what did he do? He didn't, and he lost it. Oh, desperate. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Don't, John, well done, mate. Gamble responsibly. Right, I had a quick chat yesterday with Lewis Summit from the US where he's getting closer and closer to the crucial stage in his uh, international player pathways scheme where he impresses in front of scouts. So let's hear how he's getting on. How are you getting on? How many weeks into the programme are you now? Oh, uh, seven, seven, seven or eight weeks, I think. Now. It's, uh, yeah, really good, really good, really enjoying it. Um, it's kind of flown by, to be honest with you. Like, there's not long left now. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great experience. I think I watched the latest episode of the um, the IPP series today, and, and I think someone said at one point, "This is like the dog days of your your hard work, especially in the gym." Can you talk to me about what you've been you've been doing, and I guess how much you, you might have changed physically since you went into the program compared to rugby? Yeah, so um, we got Kevin, who heads our um, S and C here, um, and he's been, he's been putting us through workouts pretty hard um, since week one. So. Um, I think, you know, everyone's getting a lot stronger, a lot physically stronger. And, um, you know, he's definitely putting us through some tough workouts. Um, and especially, as you say, like the dog days now, you know, this is when it matters, you know, week seven, week eight, when your body's tired and you've got to try and push through it. So, um, yeah, it's great. We've, got, we've only got a couple of weeks left, but, um, you know, we're all head down focused. Have you packed on more muscle? Are you, are you leaner? How's it sort of changed since you've started the programme? To be honest with you, I create, I've, I've, I've stayed pretty similar. Um, I don't want to get too heavy and get slower or vice versa. Um, but I think I'm at a perfect weight to, to be able to, to, to run fast and change direction pretty quick. So, um, you know, I'm pretty happy with my weight and, um, and stuff like that. So, You've got the pro day coming up in a few weeks. Did you watch a lot of the combine in, in Indianapolis just to get an idea of, of what's coming up? Yeah, for sure. Um, we all watched. We all watched it over that weekend, and um, you know there's some there's some exciting players in in that combine. Um, but you know we're fully focused on ourselves. There's ten of us here that are um, that are fully focused on on the on the job ahead, and um, you know we've we've all improved massively since week one, and you know we got two weeks now to to put our heads down and really focus. But at this stage of the of the program, are you more? I know you're doing a lot of stuff in the gym. Is, is it still a lot of classroom time, kind of learning things about about routes and things like that? Oh, 100%. Um, I mean, you can't you can't not learn football um, or stop learning football. You know, everyone's learning football, no matter how old you are. So, um, you know, since week one, we've been we've been in the classroom, um, you know, figuring everything out and, and learning everything everything we need to do, um, and that'll continue for the next two weeks. And um, you know, we just need we need to get smarter. Um, but I think the difference between week one and now is massive. I think everyone's getting a real good idea of the game. And, um, you know, we're all pretty excited to, to go out there and show, show everyone what we can do. Is that almost the hardest part of this process, kind of taking on board all that information in, in such a short space of time? Because obviously you have the, the physical abilities are there, but, but actually learning all those parts of the game, is, is that what seems to, to be the trickiest bit? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we're all pretty much leaving leaving our previous sports to to learn a complete new game. So, um, you know, that in itself is tough enough. But I think the difference if you were to come in week one and come in now, you'd see a you know you'd see an incredible difference between everyone's knowledge. So, um, you know, we just got to continue to to work hard in the classroom and obviously on the field and the gym, um, and just put our best uh, put ourselves in the best opportunity to to go out there and show us show the scouts what we can do. With the uh, with the combine, the the forty yard dash always kind of steals the the headlines with that, and I know yeah. a, a record was set a couple of weeks ago. Do you have have you got an idea what your time might be? Have you got anything in mind yet, or are you still working that out? 
Uh, I'm still working it out. To be honest, we we do we do a lot of speed sessions here. Um, just before training, we do we do a lot of speed sessions. So, you know, there's a, there's still a there's still a few things I want to tweak and and change up, and and it's definitely going to make me faster. Um, but I'm really excited to see what you know what time I get on the 20th of uh, March, and and hopefully, uh, you know, I run really quick. Talk to me about the, the NFL for you and, and kind of how how this all started. So, did your dad play yeah. when, when you were growing up? Is that it? And, and yeah. what kind of teams and players did you watch as well? Yeah, so my dad my dad played as a teenager um, back in the UK. Um, it was quite tough back then to to you know unless you had money and you were able to fly out to America and go to college, etc. It was really tough, and he he wasn't able to do that. So, you know, to kind of continue his legacy and and kind of you know, allow him to say like his son, his son is in the NFL is, is, would be a dream come true for me. Um, not just that, I think being a two sport athlete is pretty special. Um, you know, there's not many of them out there and, and to do that would be, would be pretty amazing for myself. Um, but I just want to, I just want to inspire people to back home to know that there is, there is a pathway to, to be in the NFL. Um, and, you know, as I'm here, the international player pathway has been unbelievable and, um, you know, this pathway is something that <clears throat> anyone from the UK can can get to and and get to the NFL. So um, it's just about working hard now. Now I'm here and and trying to get that opportunity. Has it been nice having Harry Mallander around as well? Just some a kind of familiar face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I I don't think like we obviously knew of each other, but we'd never. I think we played against each other, but we never really met each other. But, um, you know, it was pretty easy for us to get on. Um, you know, obviously he's English, which isn't great for me. But, <laughs> but no, he's, he's a great lad. And, um, you know, I'm sure he's going to go on to do great things. We're, we're talking not long before Wales kick off against France. Just wonder how yeah. much of the Six Nations have you been able to watch? And have you been sort of watching it and yeah. on your own, like with friends? Or how's it worked? Uh, I've, I've been able to watch all the Wales games. Um, the timings are pretty hard because it's, it's early in the morning here, like pretty much every game, and, and I got training, so I've been able to catch it when I can, and I've been I've been keeping up to date with it, and obviously I've seen the the, the shock result of England yesterday, um, but good on them. I mean, they've they've everyone slammed them and and ruled them out, and to go to go and beat Ireland's pretty special, so. Fair play to them, um, but no, it's, that just makes it a really interesting, a really interesting competition now because obviously Italy beat Scotland yesterday, and you know Italy could have beaten France last week. So um, you know this, I think everyone's getting really more competitive, and um, the Six Nations is, is this year especially is is definitely you know bright. And, and when you're watching, is like the rugby part of your brain still kind of whirring away, thinking about stuff, or or is that slowed down a bit? I mean, like when I watch Wales play, <laughs> I'm still like, oh, like it feels like I'm still on the pitch. Um, you know, I'll always support Wales, um, and you know, I'm going to be watching them today. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still obviously massively into into rugby and and, and keeping keeping updated on it. Um, but I know the job at hand I've got here, and I'm fully focused on that. I had a chat with George Skimmington um, not long after your move was announced and he, and he said that you spoke with him after uh, the game against Edinburgh for Gloucester and basically said, but in my mind, that's kind of my last game of rugby. Mm -hmm. I guess, that is that just like the strong mindset that you have to, to have yeah. in order to make this a success, really? Yeah, you can't have any doubts going into this. I mean, um, it's one of the toughest leagues in the world to get into, so... If you have any sort of doubt in your head, you're, you're never going to make it. So, you know, I'm fully confident in in my ability, and um, you know, we got great coaches here to to really um, lead us on to to make it in the NFL. And um, ultimately, it's up to us to to learn to learn on the field, learn in the classroom, and then um, just have that opportunity to, to perform in front of the coach. And I saw you some quotes where you, how much of a different world is it essentially going from rugby to this? Do you sort of feel I saw some quotes where you said you feel like you can sort of express yourself more in, in the NFL, like celebrations are more encouraged and things like that. Just talk to me about that and why you feel that way. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, pretty much every sport in America is massive to them. Um, you know, uh, people watching the Super Bowl, um, the, viewer, the viewers they get, 
um, just how everyone's so excited about it. Um, it's just something I want to be a part of, to be honest with you. And um, and I thought, you know, what what better league to, to be in than the NFL? Um, the fans in America are amazing. And, you know, they really cheer their teams on. So, um, you know, it'd be a dream come true to, to make it. And were you feeling that in rugby that you sort of couldn't, I know you got this stick for one of the celebrations at the World Cup. Was that kind of, I don't know, talk to me about that. Was that quite annoying? Or? Uh, I mean, I mean, like, it was obviously annoying because people thought I was being disrespectful, but I was just yeah. celebrating. Like, every sport, <laughs> pretty much every sport, um, apart from rugby, celebrates when they score. So, um, you know, I, I did that and then, you know, I was getting slammed for it, so. It wasn't great, but at the same time, I knew I wasn't being disrespectful. I was just enjoying. I was just enjoying the game, enjoying the atmosphere, enjoying being at the World Cup. Like it's absolutely massive to be at a rugby World Cup. So, um, in my head, I was just enjoying it, and <laughs> but then all of a sudden, you get slammed. But it is what it is, and um, you know, I fancy a change, and and I really want to go for this now. Have you had a chance to chat to um, to Christian Wade much about his experience? He obviously did did pretty well when when he went over there and was there for quite a while with with the bills has he given you any yeah. advice yeah we've we've had a few messages on um on instagram and stuff so uh, he's given me a, a fair bit of advice i i managed to see a a um like some a few posts from when i asked him how it was in like 2020 when he when he first when he fit when he was first you know making it out there in the, at the buffalo bills and when he scored that <laughs> that mad touchdown um so yeah he's given me a lot of advice and you know i'm taking it on board um Ultimately, I've got I've got two and a half week or one and a half weeks now to to fully focus and, and get in the best shape as possible to, to perform. And, and are you still thinking that you, you'll try and play a bit of receiver and a bit of running back? Are you still kind of working that out, or, will, or are you likely to be more more of a receiver? Do you think? No, I, I don't want to pigeon my, pigeonhole myself to be one certain position. I, I think I can I think I can play multiple positions on the pitch and. Um, and that's what I'm learning. You know, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn a lot of roles to be able to have the ability to, when I do get an opportunity, to know what I'm doing and and be fully focused on that. And I think that's great. It's great here because all the coaches, um, you know, they pre they pretty much know everything. So, um, you know, it's great having them on hand to to be able to teach me. And um, because a lot of it is in the classroom, um, being able to learn different roles and, and different um, different offenses, learn the defenses. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been great, and you know, I'm I'm absolutely loving it out here. Just to go back to Wales, I mean, they might have a win in a couple of hours, which would be great. But it, but it's obviously been a it, been an interesting tournament in kind of, in terms of developing kind of young talent. I wonder what you've made you've made of someone like Cam Winnett when you've been watching at fullback, who's kind of come in, not a lot of professional games, but but has been brilliant. How yeah. how impressive you've been by the likes of him and, and Rio Dyer as well in that, yeah. in that back three. I mean, there's there's been a lot of a lot of youngsters brought into that squad for the Six Nation. Um, I think Johan Lloyd's played amazing as well. Um, Sam's Sam's been great. Cam Winnett's been been unbelievable for for just being thrown being thrown into, you know, his first campaign. He started his first game, so um, you know, I'm very proud of those boys and what they've done. I think, um, you know, it is a young squad and it's going to take time to to build the chemistry. But I think they've done really well so far. Um, I think they've been able to put in good performances at certain times in the game. It's just about being able to do it for 80 minutes. And, um, you know, I have no doubt that, um, you know, the more games they play, the more chemistry they get, they, they're going to get better and better. Have you had much contact with, with Warren since your decision or, or, or not so much? No, not, not so much. I think, he, I think he's got... Um, I think he's got enough on his on his plate at the minute being at, being at the Six Nations. So, um no, I, but I did have great chats with him before, and you know I massively appreciate that from him. Just the last one I have for you was obviously, like you say, it has actually flown by that you're seven yeah. or eight weeks into this. I just wanted to, to hear from you just about your kind of confidence about the process and how how mm -hmm. much you're enjoying it and how how good you feel about the, the decision and and how yeah. everything's going. I mean, I think um, you know I've I've looked back at footage from week one to now and I've I think I've changed massively I think you know I've got a real learning of the game and a good understanding and um, you can just tell on the field um, the, the, the difference that the coaches have made for me and um, they've been able to help me massively um, you know I can't put into words how much they've helped me and um, 
you know, we've had a few coaches out here that have been able to change my game a bit and and teach me how to run routes, teach me how to, to play running back. Um, we've done a lot of special teams out here, so um, you know, I'm I'm so excited to see what the future holds, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see in the next we'll see in the next few weeks how it all how it all um, ends up being. But you know, I'm fully focused for the next one and a half weeks until pro day on the 20th of March, and um, yeah, I can't wait to see what the future holds. Best of luck with it. Great to speak to you. Okay, thank you. That was Lewis Rees Emmett telling us about how he's been up in the early hours watching the Six Nations and, and you know, trying to just focus on the NFL. Colsey, having uh, spoken to him, your feeling, does he make it? Oh, Charlie, that's such a hard question. Uh, listen, physically, he has as much ability as, as anyone could ever ask for to be in this position and to try and make it. So that there's nothing... I don't think there's any reason there why he couldn't do it. But but you're just on... The, the program sounds amazing in terms of how, how the players kind of handled and how they're taught the game. I think it's incredible. You're just on such a crazy crash course of like trying to learn everything about the sport, especially in his position. You have to learn so much about play calls, about which routes to run, about blocking a bit, about just how to get clear, basically. And also then you're going to be doing it against the best athletes in the world, which is a long-winded way of me saying... I think he's got as good a, good a chance as anybody. I'm fascinated to see how his pro day goes. I think realistically, the dream for him is get signed to a, a practice squad, which is kind of like a reserve squad. Have a season on that squad where you're you're kind of training some days with the main 53 man roster. I mean, first he has to get on a 90 man roster. Then when it gets down to the core 53, if he can do that. Have a year on the practice squad, try and impress. Sure. I, I, I don't see it's impossible. I've spoken with Christian Wade about this before as well, about his time for the Bills. He was kind of waiting for a chance with the Bills. He was always on the practice squad, had an amazing uh, kick or punt return touchdown in preseason. Everybody was like, whoa, who's who's this guy? And and it and it didn't quite work out. But Reese Sam is so young at 23. Maybe. Yeah. What do you think? I, I love him too. Just, yeah. because, just because I think all the commentary around it has is, is been how hard it is to do um, and I love how uh, forthright he is, how, how clearly confident he is in his own athletic ability, but also his ability to take on all, all this information. And I just think it would put rugby in, in the spotlight as well, um, as much as it might kind of be a carrot for other rugby players to leave. I think, um, yeah, to, to, to show that the sport has has those kind of kind of athletes itself would be would be really cool. Let's get into some of your questions. <laughs> We've cherry picked the best ones. So well done if you've made the cut. Starting with Will, who says it's fascinating how beefy power dominated in 2019 England were under Jones when they had the, the Vinopola brothers and Manu and, and that was like their core. But their current focal points are, are pace and, and all about targeting the shoulders at Earl, Lawrence and Furbank. Charlie, that's a, that's an interesting point, isn't it? It's a different dynamic in this side. Beefy power. Yeah. Um so, yeah. So like Borthwick has been yeah, yeah. Borthwick has been quite quite open without saying it totally explicitly that um, England are going to have to move on from, they're a different side with different assets um, than they were when Manitou Lagi, when the Vunipola brothers were in their prime. Now, um, I wouldn't say, he's he's sort of had to offset that by bringing in Ethan Roots at, at six when it was apparent that George Martin wasn't going to be fit for those first couple of Six Nations games. So they have got power Elsewhere, it means that Ellis Genge is a go-to carrier in in the tight. Whereas Billy Vinopolo would have been taking on a lot of that work. It means that they're trying to, as um, Will kind of implies, there they're trying to get Ollie Lawrence running at running at shoulders. You're trying to get Ben Earl, and as we mentioned earlier, I think Ben Earl has benefited from um, having those the, the sort of the hybrid forward in, in Chesham, who I thought was fantastic against Ireland. That's maybe given him a little bit more. Um, more room. I thought Jamie George stepped up as a carrier. I think Underhill, Sam Underhill has quietly stepped up as a carrier. Um, this, this, um, tournament, not, you know, necessarily making massively eye catching breaks, but just denting defenses of an, enough to, to generate quick work. So it's kind of been, and that has been part of this. Again, Steve Aldrich hasn't explicitly sort of implored supporters to give him patience, but. I think it's just been part of his understanding that these things are going to be gradual because it's a it's a move away from it and it is and it's really interesting because I think um, it's how he sees the profile of players coming through. I don't think there are players like Billy Manu and, and Mako knocking around that they can add 
uh, maybe someone like Alfie Barbary and, and Tom Willis as, as eight options give them something different. I mean, Ch- Chandler Cunningham South, just to, to just to go back a little bit, he was he was a guy who was fast tracked because England didn't necessarily have that dynamism, dynamism and that power. So yeah, I certainly think it's it's moving away a little bit. And I think now, whereas they've been able to bully bully teams with a sort of round the corner, round the corner, break, um, round the corner, round the corner sort of power game and phase play, I think now kick return has to be a really big a really big weapon for them. Just to add to that, I think I think it has sort of come out of necessity, hasn't it? I think that in an ideal world, they would still have a barnstorming carrying number eight, but it just doesn't necessarily exist. Maybe Alpha Barbary, as you said, Charlie, we think that he was going to be in the squad pre-tournament had he not been banned. Um, and there's nothing to say he would have started. I mean, Ben Earl is playing phenomenally well, but he is still really an open side, isn't he? I can't see him moving to eight for Saracens. So he, he could still play as he is now, um, an open side for England with a slightly more heavy duty ball carrying number eight. We always talk about Ardi Surveyor in relation to Ben Earl, and I think what the All Blacks are lucky that they've got they've had Shannon Frizzell. Um and I think I think you're right, Charles. I think with Tom Willis there, we won't see Ben Earl wearing eight, but he can still rock out there for offensive scrums, and 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 that's how they'll have that variety. You mentioning Cunning himself actually leads into our next question from Titch, who, who says, with France turning on the pair in the second half against Wales, how does that kind of affect England's bench, given that Cunning himself isn't going to be there? And so, yeah, what are they going to do? Who do you reckon they will draft in in Cunning himself's place? Charles. Um, probably Alex Coles will come back in um, alongside Don Brandt. Uh, I can't. I can't see many changes given, given how well they went at the weekend. Um, Guy Pepper has obviously been called into the squad, the wider training squad. But it would be a really sort of bold call to promote him immediately to the match day squad. Um, Having watched both games on the weekend and, and seen both benches, France got an obvious edge there. Do you think? Definitely, and there were shades. There were shades of the World Cup semi final where England are going to have to be so strong at set these for 80 minutes against this French team, um, which they obviously they weren't against South Africa in the World Cup quite spectacularly. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. Is this a start Marler and Cole sort of approach again? I mean, but then do you lose too much at scrum time if you're bringing Genge and Stewart on at 65 minutes. I'm not sure, but England are certainly going to have to be watertight there. Theory, based mm. on zero intel, they could go 6-2 given Marcus Smith's ability to cover 15 and they could add Coles um, to the bench that they had on Saturday maybe with uh, Pearson instead of Chandler Cunning himself and then keeping Don Brandt there. Don Brandt was a really interesting selection, I think, and that was uh, tied to the kick return opportunities that they thought they were going to get. And Chandler Cunningham South had one really sort of old school, I think it was from a 22 dropout where he just got the ball sort of left and right and went, tilted the lance and, and gave it a go because that was just such an important avenue for England. So be, that'd be, re- yeah, I, I agree. I think, and I think 6 2 always comes into um, your thinking against France. Um, so that would be very interesting. Not to pour cold water on that, but Pearson isn't actually in the squad. Yeah, he's not. Well, there you go. So, so could you Ben Curry is, is Ben Curry still there, or is he is he dropped ben out? Ben Curry's not injured? there either. You could go. He was injured, wasn't he, Ben Curry? <laughs> maybe. So, just looking at it, maybe it'll be Coles, Roots, and Don Brandt. Oh, Wouldn't be surprised, yeah. Which is which is lumps, big big old lumps. Sorry, um, Tom Pearson. Yeah, me too. I'm sorry. Tom. Rub it in. I'm sorry, you should be in. Um, Giles asks, how many games can you cite where it was the sixth bench forward who made a difference to the result? I assume here he's talking about. I'll tell you the World Cup. Why did teams go six two? Yeah, Quagga Smith in the World Cup final. <laughs> that was so sad. He was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean Ryan Baird wasn't the sixth bench forward the other week against Wales for Ireland, but he was pretty unbelievable. Yeah. He was wearing number no, twenty. Quagga so. Smith and the familiarity that Felix Jones has with him, wind him up, watch him go, watch him absolutely wreck breakdowns. Um, he was arguably the difference in that in that World Cup final as New Zealand came on. Yeah, that's a good answer. I, I don't think we need to top that anymore. And our last question, which many of you many of you said 
um, presumably from the Leicester area. Is there a way Freddie Stewart can be accommodated in this system moving forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is, Charles, but, but there's been clearly an uptick in how England have attacked, even though it's two games, with George Furbank at fullback. So, so what, how does it happen? I'm not sure, in all honesty. I think that Furbank has got the shirt. I think as Charlie has written, um, certainly two of those three England tries, they probably don't score with, with Freddie Stewart at 15. Freddie Stewart's super strength is obviously his aerial ability. And against teams that like to kick high and follow up, um, he'll be more uh, um, more valuable to that England side. Uh, um, but Furbank has the shirt and he's looked a, a, a class apart ball in hand. I mean, he's he's been playing so well for Northampton and he offers something much different in the 15 shirt to Freddie Stewart. And if England are looking to going, looking at going down this route of a more ball-playing fullback, then that is not Freddie Stewart um, at the minute. And, and I, I know I was chatting to a Guillaume Dufy, friend of the pod. Um, friend of the pod. Uh, of of, of Le, Le Keep. Last week, uh, the French uh, sports newspaper, and that was what he was asking as well. He was like, I can't believe that Freddie Stewart has been dropped. He's one of the best fullbacks in the world. Um, and, and my response was just quite simply, yes, but what what the skills the skills that George Furbank has and is bringing to this England team is what this England team is lacking. Whereas what, what Freddie Stewart, what Freddie Stewart brings is, you know, in, incredible high ball technical abilities but if if teams aren't going to kick in that manner then you would have fur banking wouldn't you if, the, I'm, if I'm honest sorry, sorry Charlie I you no, I'm just going to say the one the one sort of um, the one kind of uh, I guess caveat to that is that that would be a way that England will get contestable kicks I I imagine will be a way that England tried to get into the game against against France because they've not looked entirely convincing over the over the course of this championship in in that area and there's um yeah so that's i did also just go back and check the um the bench for the world cup final and quaggle smith was the uh the sixth bench forward but they also obviously had a seventh bench bench well forward. but it counts so you I'm technically answered it. Answer, yeah. I, I was i was purely going to add that i'm in a way I, I never thought we would have this conversation about Stuart just because i thought england would be so loyal to him that they would find a way to sort of bit operate around him and, and compensate for those kind of things that he lacks because they liked his high ball ability so much. So actually, in a way, it's almost a credit to England that they have moved off him. Well, I think the way you move, I, I certainly think he, as I wrote, I certainly think he adds to the 33 caps he's got at the minute. But I think what that might take now is a, a either a different midfield, which you don't really want to do now that that's one settling, or just more prominence from Slade as a distributor, which actually we saw against Ireland a little bit. Right, that's it for today. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charles. And a big thanks to Lewis Rue Samet as well for his time. Um, hope everything goes well on the pro day. Thank you, everybody, for downloading the podcast. There's one more round of games in this year's Six Nations to come. There's wall-to-wall coverage over on the Telegraph website throughout the week. Oh, where are you going to be, by the way? Sorry. Charles, where are you going to be? Leon for the crunch. Charlie, where are you going to be? Cutting around Penny Hill Park again for the first half of the week and then off to Leon on Friday. Okay. And I'm going to be in Dublin where I, I assume Ireland are going to win the Six Nations title. I would have thought so. Let's let's say let's say not just to build up the tension. Um, but the three of us will, will be back next week to review the final round of the Six Nations. It's going to be the final episode of the series as well. Save your tears. We've had a lovely time. We'll chat to you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>